the use of cannabinoids for chronic pain, particularly neuropathic pain, which I see a lot in malignancies, either associated with chemotherapies or sometimes the malignancies themselves. Um, and then actually, ironically, oh, and also maybe spasticity with multiple sclerosis, and then also, um, ironically, not such great evidence for the, the one indication that exists in the United States, which is chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, that's the AMV. Um, and then sleep and Tourette sort of fell a distant uh, third. But this is, I think, actually the more comprehensive summary slide. This actually is from the Academy's website. You can download these for free, too, and show them in public. Uh, they're part of the public domain. So again, in adults with chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, oral cannabinoids are effective antiemetics. And in adults with chronic pain, patients who were treated with cannabis or cannabinoids are more likely to experience a clinically significant reduction in pain symptoms. That's pretty much it. Um, so again, I get the easy stuff because um, it's not so controversial. Um, I'm going to skip the neurology reviews because I think it was, it was addressed actually very well already by Dr. Hussain. Um, I, I will mention one thing that he may not have touched on, which is that uh, Orrin Davinsky, who is a neurologist at NYU, actually has published an open label trial of uh, EPDLX in um, some of these very treatment resistant pediatric epilepsy syndromes uh, showing some efficacy. The reproducibility safety thing, again, has been touched on by, by many others. Uh, I will um, uh, just remind you of that as we go forward. There was an intriguing little, little uh, sample study that compared randomly purchased uh, uh, dispensary cannabis in LA, San Francisco, and Seattle. And the finding was that only about 15% of the samples had in them what the label said. But in LA, you got more for your money. LA tended to be underlabeled, while San Francisco and Seattle, you tend to get less than you thought you were buying. <laughs> Uh, I would also mention that, although you might wonder whether there is a political or other motivation here, the FDA has published a small series of um, randomly purchased Amazon and other internet-based CBD buys. And what they tell you is there's no CBD in that stuff, so why would you spend your money on it? Uh, again, they, they may have reasons for that, but um, that's, what's, that's sort of the limit that's what's out there. I'm not going to get much into molecular pharmacology. This is the only science slide I'm going to show you, and it's a best guess about how cannabinoids may uh, be analgesic. I think what is fairly clear is that um, they, it is not via CB1 or CB2 receptors. What is much less clear is, and so how do they work? And this idea that they may agonize glycine receptors, particularly in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, is one of the leading theories, though by no means fact. Okay, so what about the actual studies? This is really my main emphasis. I promise I'll be done on time. Um, this is the first study done by Don Abrams. Don Abrams is a medical oncologist at um, San Francisco General Hospital, UC San Francisco. Don was a member of the August group that did the Academy's review that you've already heard about. Uh, Don has also been a member since its inception in 1996 of the, the state of California's uh, chartered uh, cannabis research uh, entity, which is based at UC San Diego and chaired by Igor Grant. And um, they've been frustrated by just the set of federal rules that have already been mentioned. So actually, this was um, the first double-blind placebo-controlled trial uh, uh, that I ever saw uh, of uh, cannabis. And this is the only one that, you, that studies whole leaf cannabis. So this was uh, people with a severe HIV polyneuropathy. These were habitual cannabis smokers. This was Mississippi Federal Pot Farm grade stuff. Whether you consider that good or bad, I will leave up to you. Um, uh, it would either extracted in a chemical way, so it looked like, smelled like marijuana, but didn't work like marijuana, or the, the real deal. They were admitted to the inpatient study unit for two or three days before exposure, so they were probably well into that unpleasant discontinuation syndrome that we heard from Dr. Cooper about. And then they were randomized either to active whole leaf marijuana cigarettes or placebo extracted. The finding was quite robust. So if you're a drug company and you have a new pain product and you want the FDA to approve it for a pain indication and you show that 50% of the people in your active group got 30% or more pain relief, that's a slam dunk for FDA approval, right? And if patients say, I would take that, that's a double slam dunk, okay? So from that point of view, this is a winning finding. Um, this is you know, just a graphic representation of the data. The biggest criticism of this study was A, it wasn't very big, and B, these were habitual consumers of cannabis, so they probably knew within about 20 seconds of um, getting randomized and inhaling whether they were getting active drug uh, or placebo. But the finding was still robust, and um, despite the possibility that they had a strong hunch what they were getting, the two groups separated. Um, you might say that's, that's actually an enhanced effect. Okay, that's it for whole leaf marijuana. Everything else is vaporized using the volcano that you saw a picture of. 
or nabiximols, which is the one-to-one racemic mixture liquid actually produced in a factory by a pharmaceutical company. So this, um, again, a small trial, double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial of vaporized cannabis at two dosing levels. I suspect this was federal pop farm marijuana too, versus placebo. This was different kinds of neuropathic pain. They were both low and medium dose, dose active drugs, and then uh, both of those were superior in a statistical way to placebo. Again, the finding was uh, pretty robust. So, so um, NNT stands for numbers needed to treat. That's a way of comparing different um, interventions for the same problem. If you look at the ineffective anti-neuropathic pain treatments that we have, which include gabapentin and duloxetine and tricyclocanada press and some other things, you would see, see that a number needed to treat of three makes you the pride of the regimen. That means you need to treat three patients to get a, a, a significant clinical benefit. Duloxetine, which is actually the only evidence-based treatment for chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, has an NNT of about four or five. Gabapentin, which is sort of the first-line treatment for nerve pain in 2017, has an NNT of between five and seven. Um, so that's actually pretty darn good. Um, and again, suggests that there is likely something going on. Uh, these are the two active uh, doses compared to placebo with statistically significant separation at every, uh, at every uh, measurement beginning at 60 minutes after, after the start. Okay, another small trial uh, done by Wallace and colleagues. Again, vaporized cannabis. Again, this is diabetic neuropathic pain, DPMP, a specific kind of neuropathic pain, common in folks who have had diabetes for some years, randomized, 16 patients. Uh, so again, placebo versus one versus four versus seven percent THC, uh, and um, both pain intensity and subjective highness, it was kind of interesting that they, they studied subjective highness, as well as cognitive effects. You probably can predict the findings based on what you already know, which is that there were improvements on a dose-related basis both in pain control, uh, in allodynia, which is a symptom in people who have uh, neuropathic pain, as well as hyperalgesia. Allodynia is essentially a non, non-noxious stimuli or unpleasant, so light touch is unpleasant if you have neuropathic pain. Hyperalgesia is you have a stronger than normal uh, pain response to a noxious or painful stimulus. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, people when they were uh, intoxicated had worse neuropsych functioning than at baseline and returned to that. This is sort of too, too much uh, detail. It probably doesn't even project very well, so I'm just going to skip through it. Okay, now we're going to move on to Sativex. So once again, Sativex is nabiximols. It's the one-to-one uh, racemic mixture of THC to CBD. It's a sublingual spray. What may not have been mentioned today is that actually nabiximols is approved by the Canadian version of the FDA. It's also approved by the Spanish version of its FDA and a number of other European countries available. And it's been in phase three clinical trials in the United States for about four years, which does not bode well. I don't know the right people to know what the, what the deal is, but I can't find anything on that internet thing about where it stands. Um, but um, nonetheless, a promising study. So this is um, a multi-arm double-blind placebo-controlled trial, again, of nabiximols versus pure THC versus placebo. Uh, and um, this is folks with intractable cancer pain. So these are folks very much like people I care for each day. And this was quite interesting because they also looked at an interesting question, which is whether there was any impact on milligrams per day of opioids required. So almost everyone with advanced treatment-resistant cancer pain is going to be on one form or another of an opioid analgesic. And they don't, all those medicines don't always work perfectly, and even at high dose, sometimes they aren't effective or lose their effectiveness or cause more side effects than benefits. So if there were a finding that cannabinoids spared opioids, meaning you needed fewer milligrams per day to get the same effect, or somehow made them more effective, that would be really notable. That's a picture of nabiximols, well, the, the study of nabiximols or placebo, and this is the randomization. And I'll try to interpret this for you, again, because I'm not sure how well it projects. The short version is uh, that at all, uh, to- at all points, nabiximols was superior to pure THC and superior to placebo. Uh, there were um, very robust effects, particularly, uh, uh, as you can see, about 30% of the uh, uh, reduction in pain in a significant number of the patients. And although it isn't shown here, there actually was an opioid sparing effect. Uh, and so that's, again, quite notable and uh, of interest. Another nabiximols for opioid-treated cancer pain This is folks with poorly controlled pain. Uh, These were folks, again, this is just the randomization. This is uh, uh, the number of sprays per day uh, against placebo. Uh, And this is the world's literature on uh, 
on uh, cannabinoids in pain, which I don't think has been improved upon since the, this review was studied or was published in 2015. So not that many studies, again, about 6,500 people altogether. Um, I may have hit on the points I wanted to, which leaves us uh, plenty of time for conversation. Jeff, how are we doing time-wise? Good. So I'll stop and see if you have anything to, to add or ask. Uh, the, question, the question is about psilocybin, maybe more broadly about hallucinogens in end of life. So it is off the topic. Um, I, I know only what um, New York Times and New Yorker readers know, uh, which is there's some really interesting stuff there. Charlie Grove, who's a member of our faculty at UC, uh, at Harbor UCLA, knows a lot more. That's emotional pain, not physical pain. Correct. To my knowledge, it's really psychic distress slash death anxiety, and or, and or in this case, ketamine depression. <coughs> Please. Uh, so, regarding the uh, uh, cancer uh, radiotherapy, uh, in uh, oral, uh, in head and neck uh, cancer, uh, radiotherapy uh, commonly uh, reduces uh, neurocytis. Very likely for patients. Do you know of any studies with the spray that you mentioned that uh, might have a positive effect? So, you said radiotherapy reduces mucositis, but did no, you mean no, to no, say no, causes, causes it? Yes. Yes. So the question, if I understood it, was: Is there evidence that um, that uh, nabiximol sublingual spray uh, helps reduce the pain associated with uh, radiation right. mucositis? I don't. There is no such evidence. Um, the FDA gets very twitchy about studying well, transmucosal drugs when people have mucositis because they're worried about more uh, more exposure. Um, so, for example, there's a whole class of pain medicines, uh, the transmucosal fentanyl products that are used rapidly uh, delivered opioids across the mucosa. Um, but that was perhaps not the core of your question. The answer is no, no evidence. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, most people use topical anesthetics in opioids, and it would be great to study. Thank you, Doctor. Um, what do you think about the studies that show that in states that have legalized medical marijuana in some form, opioid deaths have decreased? Right. So thank you for asking. And actually, this is a point Dr. Cooper touched on, but I think it's worth saying a word or two more. The finding, and this is the Bach-Huber trial that was on her slide, was about a 10-year review of opioid overdose deaths in post-legalization states. And the finding was a nearly 25% reduction in opioid overdose deaths in those states after cannabis legalization. That was a correlation study. It was not a causality study. Um, about 60% of the patients in that trial had a prescription for opioids, so they were folks which, who presumably either were faking out their doctor or who had a, a bona fide pain problem for which they were getting opioids. Uh, and um, it's a quite interesting question that you pose, right? So could it be that people need less opioid be because they have access to cannabis? Or could it be they stop using opioids altogether because they have access to cannabis? There's some interesting work by Yasmin Hurd that I don't think has been touched on now, looking at the role of CBD in attenuating opioid craving and opioid withdrawal, uh, possibly potentiating analgesia. Um, so that certainly could be uh, another element of the story. Um, and there's related data, really interesting for the wallet grabbers in the room, which has already been mentioned, um, from Medicare. There's some Medicare uh, expenditure analyses showing that after legalization, uh, prescriptions for and uh, Medicare costs for antidepressants, sedative hypnotics, opiate analgesic, and benzodiazepines go down in, in, in states. Quite fascinating, unexplained. Thank you for uh, this is a very interesting talk. Um, and I apologize in advance if you answer this, I might have missed. But it sounded like you were saying THC has an effect on pain. THC plus CBD had a greater effect on pain. Do we know about CBD by itself? So you're asking one of the really hard and great questions, which is either in this mess that I showed you or from other sources, might you begin to deduce something about what is analgesic about whole leaf marijuana? I don't know the answer. I don't know if anybody knows the answer. I, um, I don't know of trials of pure CBD agents for pain. That doesn't mean they don't work. I just don't. Do, do you know, Dr. Cooper, or does anybody? They're doing, they're doing one. Stay tuned. And Dr. Frankel is going to tell us something, too. I find it that younger you are, it seems 
more you need some THC to sustain each other. I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you have more to add? Okay. Other comments, questions? Uh, I get to do a Dr. Pierre and say, I don't know, and I don't think there's evidence to answer the question. Please. I just, thank you for presenting all these studies. I wanted to ask, if you have the ability to ask your colleagues, what, are the, what is the research you want them to do? What are some of the questions you want to see answered? I'm interested in what, 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 do we, what, is the speci what are the analgesic elements of what's in whole leaf marijuana? Is it CBD, THC together? Might it be CBD alone? I mean, there's, we've heard lots of things today that might suggest that if CBD alone were therapeutic, that might be great because we would presumably be much less worse, much less worried about the, the behavioral reinforcing and the in induction of psychosis and physical dependence and withdrawal. Uh, and um, maybe we'd even get a little anti-seizure prophylaxis mixed in with everything else. So I think that's a really important and interesting one. More generally, what is the dose-response relationship? I'd also like to know whether there really is an opioid sparing effect. Thank you very much. Thank you.